quiet it down. Now the music stopped and everyone quieted it down. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Barlow Dermogradichin with the Armenian Studies Program, and I'd like to welcome you to what is our third event in a very busy semester that started on August 31st with the grand opening of the Soroyan House Museum, and we held a big celebration here on campus, and more than 700 people joined uh, to really celebrate the life of William Soroyan and the opening of the Soroyan Museum. Uh, about a week and a half ago, we had a, the opening of a uh, exhibition at the Henry Madden Library called Genocides of the 20th Century, and that uh, exhibition will be running through the end of October. So if you have not had a chance to see it, it's on the second floor of the Henry Madden Library. It's free, and you can go at any time that the library has, uh, is open, and you'd have to go online to see the hours, but it has its regular hours, and you'd be able to see that. Uh, this evening, when you were looking uh, prior to this at some of the events that are upcoming, um, if you're interested in our next two events, some of the students have uh, flyers, so if you're interested in getting one, you can just raise your hand right now while I tell you a little bit about our next two events. Uh, the next one is a really a quite exciting event, I think. It's called The Business of Regret, War, Chaos, and the Rejection of Violence. And from the title of it, you think it'd be a really dark lecture, but it's actually an art exhibit. And we're going to feature the work of an Armenian artist coming from Atlanta, Georgia, by the name of Henrik Abedian. And we're pairing him with our own local artist, Vara Samuelian, because Vara's entire life was about the rejection of war and peace. And so we're going to feature works of both artists. And actually, this is going to be a two-day kind of event. On October the 3rd, which is a Wednesday night, at 5.30 PM, there's going to be an artist talk. Henrik will be here, as well as some of our faculty from Fresno State, to discuss the works of both of these. And that's between 5.30 and 6.30. It'll be here. But on Thursday night, October the 4th, is the opening reception for the art exhibit. And that's going to be held at the M Street Graduate Studio way down in, in downtown on 1419 M Street, and we're going to have the artwork actually out there, and you'll also be able to meet the artist. Both of these are, events are free, and you're all welcome to join us for those. Again, if you would like more information, the students are here with, uh, with their flyers. Then, the week following that, we're going to have a very special two-day conference uh, called the Committee of Union and Progress, Founders, Ideology, and Structure. And the Committee of Union and Progress was the political party in power in Ottoman Turkey in 1915 when the genocide uh, erupted or started. And so the speakers are going to be talking about this political party. And we have a really top lineup of uh, speakers coming from all over the world. Uh, we're going to start on Friday night, October the 12th, with Dr. Raymond Kevorkian coming all the way from Paris. And he is one of the key uh, figures, scholars in the world on the Armenian genocide. And then we're also bringing Hans Lukas Kieser from Australia and he has just written a new biography of Talat Pasha. And we're going to be selling that book. It's his book that he's coming to talk about uh, not only Talat Pasha, but Zia Golkab. We'll also have uh, other guests, including Dr. Uh, Yektan Turkilmaz, who was our visiting professor in the spring, Dikran Kaligyan from Boston University, another Turkish uh, scholar from Princeton University, Duygu Joskuntuna. She'll be talking about the memoirs of the Young Turks, and then our own visiting professor, Dr. Umi Kurt, will also be talking about uh, the Committee of Union and Progress. We have lots and lots of events coming up. Please look at our website or go to our Facebook and you'll be able to see our upcoming uh, events. Tonight, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Umi Kurt, who's going to be speaking on Jamal Pasha, a rescuer, an enigma, and a genocidaire. And his talk is part of our lecture series, but he's actually our 15th visiting professor in Armenian studies. It started all the way back in the year 2000 when Dr. Richard Hovanesian was appointed as the first uh, visiting professor in Armenian studies. And uh, so we're very happy that Dr. Kurt was appointed as our 15th uh, visiting professor in Armenian studies. Dr. Kurt completed his doctorate in the Department of History at Clark University in Massachusetts, and he is currently what is called a Polonsky Fellow at the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. This is a prestigious five-year fellowship which brings scholars from throughout the world and gives them the opportunity to really conduct their research without having to deal with other things that you might have to deal with in a university position. It's a, it's a quite prestigious position, so we're very happy that uh, he has been appointed to that. 
What is tonight's talk about? I'll just give you a very brief uh, sort of overview of it. Jamal Pasha was generally known for his very rigid policies towards Arab nationalists and Zionists during his posting in Greater Syria. But his role in the Armenian Genocide is the controversial part of uh, his sort of uh, existence. That is, some people uh, account him as being very much part of World War I and the genocide. But others have a differing view. And tonight, Dr. Kurt will examine those two differing perspectives and come up with his own conclusion based on his research. So that's what our talk uh, tonight is about. Uh, Dr. Kurt has just completed uh, and just published a new book. And it's called Eintop 1915, Genocide and Perpetrators. Dr. Kurt is actually a native of Eintop, which is today in Turkey. But during the genocide, I think there are very there must be a few of you that are from Eintop or have Eintop see um, blood in you. And this monograph examines the genocide of uh, the Armenians in the city of Eintop. So without any further uh, introduction, I'm very pleased to welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Umi Kurt. Dr. Kurt. Much. You guys, can you guys hear me properly? I have a mic. You hear me now? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the generous introduction. It's really great to be back, back home for me. Um, I have spent a great deal, a great uh, deal of time here, so it's like I feel really uh, being home again. So, and I'm also honored to bear the uh, uh, 15 uh, visiting professor in our main studies program. So, I will be <coughs> giving three lectures over the course of the program. So, the first lecture is uh, that, is just uh, about Jamal Pasha. With Jamal Pasha. So, I would like to start with uh, a quote from, from him. Actually, uh, the quote, the speech del delivered by him as the commander of the 4th Army at the Haidar Pasha station in Istanbul, addressing the crowds gathered to see him off as he left for Syria. <coughs> quote, I appreciate the lof loftiness of my duty, and I am also aware of the kind of great difficulties I will be faced with while carrying out this duty. I will not stop at any sacrifice in order to gain victory. If I cannot be victorious, I will fill the water of the canal with the corpses of myself and my friends. Undoubtedly, the heroes who are left behind will walk over our corpses and enter the land, land of Egypt. They will rescue this Islamic country from the invasion of the British." Unquote. So, my talk has <coughs> four parts. I'll start with basically his, uh, let's say, CV, uh, and, and, and then Jamal Pasha's army policy, and then I'm going to analyze him as a rescue, of course, quote unquote, and then I will analyze him as an enigma, and finally, I will come up with uh, his, his perpetratorship in the Armenian genocide as a genocide. So, Jamal Pasha held the most significant position following Talat and Enver in the history of the Committee of Union and Progress Government, following the redeclaration of the Constitution on July 23, 1908, Jamal was elected member of the head of office, thus being thrust into the forefront of the CUP. He joined the Action Army, which the CUP mobilized against the counter-revolution uprising that broke out in April 1909, and he served in Istanbul as district governor of Üsküdar in 1909, and then was dispatched to Adana as governor. So after Adana massacres, he was dispatched to Adana and appointed as a district, uh, as a district governor. In 1911, he was appointed to the governorship of Baghdad, and during the Balkan Wars, Jamal commanded reserve troops in Trace as colonel, uh, and he took part in the CUP coup d'etat attempt in January 1913, against the Freedom and Accurate Party government. The new Grand Vizier after the coup d'etat, Mahmoud Shevket Pasha, assigned him the military governorship of Istanbul. He was promoted to general in December 1913, became Pasha in, and in February 1914, he became the Minister of Navy, 
Soon after, the Ottoman Empire entered the war in November 1914. Jamal Pasha also accepted the post of the military commander and governor in Greater Syria. He then became general governor of Syria, Palestine, Cilicia, and Hijaz, making on February 4, 1915, Jerusalem his military headquarters. So he was notoriously known for his rigid policies towards Arab nationalists and Zionists during his posting in Greater Syria. Jamal Pasha and his role in Armenian genocide has always remained an issue of contention. There are important accounts of Jamal, Jamal's activity, particularly during the war, which have found him to have had no active role in the deportation and extermination of Armenians, here dif differing from the other two pillars of the CUP, Enver and Talab. On the contrary, they argue that he extended a helping hand to Armenians in so far as his authority and power would allow, and then and that he even faced off against members of the central government in Istanbul and the CUP head office to do so. So my talk will question that argument, examining the politics of Jamal during the war while concentrating on his approach to the Armenian matter. I will also explore his own responsibility for the genocide in so far as in so far context and contingencies play played a role in this crime. So let's start with Jamal's, uh, Jamal Pasha's policy towards Armenia. In the le relevant literature, there is no consensus on his stance towards Armenians. Ilmar Kaiser, for, his, for example, stresses that Jamal stood resolutely against genocide, noting that he exposed a strategy even if only partially implemented, that remained independent of the political center. Raymond Kevorkian, on the other hand, highlights the military rationale behind Jamal's practice of husbanding the labor power of the Armenians prior to their later extermination. Kevorkian, as well as Don Bloxham, also point to a secret agenda behind Jamal's milder, milder measures, noting that he had aspirations encouraged by the allies in greater Syria of forming a government on his own in the region. Fuad Dündar, on the other hand, asserts that Jamal Pasha's more lenient tri treatment of Armenians was aimed at counterbalancing the weight of Arab influence in the region. Al Hacicek, another scholar, rejects all of the aforementioned interpretations and holds that Jamal, contrary to the anti Armenians Talab and Enver, and other co core members of the CUP, as represented by two physicians, Dr. Nazim and Bahattin Shakir, all of whom had adopted an exterminatory policy, was acting on entirely human impulses as he wished to protect Armenians and save them from genocide. Here, I shall argue that, on the contrary, Jamal Pasha's real position on the Armenians differs substantially from the assessment available in the current scholarship. I hold that his conduct towards the ethnic groups in Greater Syria beginning first and foremost with Arabs, Armenians, and Jews, was aimed at subduing them so as to make them incapable of harming the sovereignty, unity, and authority of the Ottoman state. To this end, he practiced radical and harsh disciplinary methods, exerting great effort to ensure, especially that the Armenian population would not constitute a majority in any of the regions to which they were deported, nor be in a position to make claims that might pose a threat to the sovereignty and survival of the Ottoman state. As a matter of fact, Jamal's perception of a so-called Armenian question was not so very different from the general stance of the CUP, and thus that of Enver and Talab. Jamal Pasha considered the Armenians' demands for reform and the incentive they offered to the European great powers to put pressure on the Ottoman government, which has resulted in the February 1914 reform agreement, as a stain on the honor and dignity of the empire. Therefore, he held the same view as Talab and Enver and the wings of the party that they represent. That such a threat and the trouble it encouraged should be eliminated absolutely. According to Jamal Pasha, quote, the Armenian uprisings are events that place the existence of the state in danger and whose suppression creates an obligation for self-defense." Yet, throughout his career as a statement, Jamal maintained good relations with the Armenian congregation's leaders and leading members of this community. Particularly, during his time as the governor of Adana, 
around August 19 or 1909. He played an active role in the trial and punishment of those involved in the massacres of Armenians that had occur occurred in the province that spring coming to the aid of Armenians who had been subject to those atrocities. Such behavior put Jemal in a position to assume the role of a negotiator as compared to Talat and Enver, where Armenians were concerned. The most fundamental difference between Jamal and the other two leaders was the methods he wanted to employ to decrease the number of Armenians to a level that will no longer pose a threat to the Ottoman state. It's at this point, Jamal Pasha emerged as an assimilationist and a disciplinarian as opposed to the proponent of extermination. He adopted a project for the Turkification and Islamization of Armenians and systematically implemented these ideals. Therefore, he did not allow mass extermination to take place in the provinces, townships and administrative authorities under the command of Fourth Army, over which he presided. He did, however, intensively implement conversions to Islam in these regions, actualizing his ideals. The result was that he held roles that, where the Armenians were concerned, were subject to change at any moment. A definitive characteristic of our understanding of Jamal and his role in the execution of violence has been shaped by the perceptions of his victims. In both his correspondence with influential members of the Armenian community and in the memoirs of some of those who survived the genocide, the picture of Jamal differs vastly from the death of Enver and Talib. The correspondence between Jamal Pasha and the Sahak Kavayan, Catholicos of Giligia, Sahak II, in February 1915, when the deportations began in Zeytun and Dörtyol, and at various phases of the deportation through March of the year, present us with an important data about the Armenian policies of the central government and the position and stance held by Jamal on these decisions. One of the first points that comes to the fore in these telegrams is the continual and existent request by the Catholicos to Jemal for an improvement in the situation of Armenians and the protection of their lives, possessions and honor. In fact, the correspondence itself is evidence that he believed, Catholicos, Sahak II, believed that Jamal could and would play an effective role in overcoming these mounting difficulties facing the Armenians. Had Jamal not energetically set about uh, making the conditions of the Armenians better after he had been appointed governor to Adana in the wake of April 1909 Armenian massacres. These and other helpful policies constitute an historical memory that make hope in Jamal's goodwill possible for the Catholicos. Therefore, he would send a telegram to the Jamal regarding the detainment of draft evaders on March 23, 1915, requesting that Actions being taken that gendarmeries not be expanded to include innocent population. In his telegram, the Catholicos would stress that majority of Armenians were loyal to both the state and the governing authority and had followed the general call for mobilization faithfully. He stated that they too wished for the draft evaders to be caught. He requested from Jamal, however, that the security measures being taken not affect the safety and peace ordinary Armenians in Zeytun. In fact, Jamal Pasha agreed with him. In his response, a telegram dated March 26, he stressed that he held the same point of view and it was a sacred duty for him to protect the lives and possessions of the innocent people. However, he strongly cautioned the Catholicos against his people creating even the slightest impression that they look kindly upon the bandits that these draft dodgers, in fact, were let alone that they actually supported them in any capacity. Afterwards, Sahak Kavayan, who then resided in Adana, informed the Zeytun Armenian bishop on March 27, 1915, of his correspondence with Jamal, conveying the warnings that were given by him. On the same day, he would send a telegram to the Jamal, reporting that what he had done. He did not stop at this, however. On March 29th, he would send another telegram to Bishop to inform the people that they should not be concerned as he had secured Jamal Pasha's guarantee that their lives and possessions, possessions would be protected. To this end, he advised the people to refrain from 
any activity that will violate the peace and good order. During the same period, however, March and April 1915, the deportation of Armenians in the province of Adana and surrounding districts began. In April, the Catholicos tried again to intervene. And of course, his primary contact during this period was Jamal Pasha. Sahak II, who had found out all of the men from Swedia districts, five villages, had without exception been deported, reported the situation to Jamal Jalal Bey, sorry, governor of Aleppo. In his telegram, April 6, 1915, he noted that the Armenian population there made this living mostly through the silkworm trade, and that if the community were deprived of its male population, it would result in great economic privation. Thus, he requested that Jalal Bey have all men who had passed the age of military conscription, as well as those who had not yet reached it, be sent back to their homes. In another telegram, dated May 3rd, 1915, addressed to Jamal Pasha, he would stress yet again that the whole of, whole of the Armenian congregation in his spiritual circle were faithfully loyal to the state. Yes, yet, despite all their efforts, the deportation of entire Armenian population of Zaytun had begun. The ill treatment and the misfortunes that befell the Armenian community deported from Zaytun deeply saddened the Catholicos. He would send another telegram to Jamal about the case on May 3, 1915. While informing him of what had happened to Zaytun's Armenians, he again requested Jamal's intervention. He would highlight once again, while there might be some Armenian partisans in the region, these people were never representative of the community as a whole, nor accepted by them, as the Armenians of Zaytun remained deeply loyal to the state. He will add further that it was not just the Armenians of Zaytun, but those in Marash, Ainta, Kilis, Hajin, Adana, and Aleppo, who in their majority remain loyal to both their state and their government. It appears, however, that the Catholicos' hopes were in vain. For the destination of the deportees actually worsened, shifting from Konya to Derzot on 24th of April. As of May 7th, a total of 4,384 Armenians had been exiled from Marash as well. On 15 May, in another telegram from Adana to Jamal Pasha, a desperate Catholicos pleaded that, at the very least, the weakest be spared. Quote, I ask that on behalf of the innocent, comprised comprise of the sick, the pregnant women, the children and adolescents, so that the streams and the hilltops don't become their graves, their demise, their prayers of thanks for you, are what will enrich your life with value. Please show mercy, so that you may please the Almighty Creator. I seek refuge in your conscience. I have no other door to knock on. I ask that you grant a benevolence that will wipe the tears from my eyes and become bound to my mom, my, my wound, uncle. Following this, Jamal sent another telegram on May 17th to Talat. In his telegram, he would reveal in a sense, his own deportation strategy. It would, he would stress that he had embraced the central government's decision to deport all the Armenians in Zaytun, including Dörtyol, Hajin, and Hassan Beyli. However, the sick, disabled, as well as pregnant women should temporarily be exempted. In the meantime, he would mobilize military resources to assist deportation and provide other provisions of Armenian families. He also stated to Talat Pasha his view that the possessions and the properties left behind by the Armenians should be placed under legal protection. He alluded particularly to the situation of Armenian women and children, underlining that the tragedy that befell them would gravely taint the reputation of the state. The hopes of the Catholicos, however, would once again prove in vain. Deportation from the areas surrounding Adana, Zaytun, and Marash will continue at full speed. On June 15th, Sahak Kabayan, who now resided in Aleppo, would send another telegram to Jamal Pasha, reporting on the situation of those deportees who could still be rich. The details in the telegram are very important. He noted that it was the innocent, along with the guilty, who were being torn from their homes and under horrific conditions. They were not being, they were, they were not being given bread or housing, they were not even graves to bury the deceased. 
He requested at least 20, 20 members of a household be allowed to live in a single locale. Jamal, however, did not want Armenians to reside together any more than did Talat and Enver. The existence of Armenian community must not be allowed under any circumstance. On the same date, the Catholicos would send another telegram, this time to the provincial authorities of Adana. In his telegram, he explained that the Armenians who had arrived in Aleppo after an arduous 12-day journey, during which they were hungry, thirsty, and deprived of any kind of substances, after having been forbidden to gather up, even the smallest of their personal belongings, had been subject to all forms of oppression at the hands of officers who had been appointed to protect them, so-called protect them, on this journey. Upon hearing this, on 21st of June 1915, Jamal Pasha sent another telegram to Sahar Kavaya, asking if there had been any violation of the bodies, possessions and properties of Armenians who had been transferred to various sites. He asked that he personally be informed if such occurrences had taken place. Similarly, he gave his word to Catholicos that the help he requested in his previous telegram in addition to other needs, would be provided. In a telegram dated 26th of June, the Catholicos replied that there had been no direct attacks on the lives of the possessions of the deportees to whom he had referred. He stressed, however, the existence of cases involving the deliberate targeting of the honor of the Armenian woman, which required investigation. But at least even this picture appeared benign. He added that Armenians had been displaced without any pocket money, clothing or provisions, and the owners of the farms and animals were not even allowed to sell their livestock in order to purchase a vehicle, this while being forced to abandon their lands in the middle of the harvest season. He stressed to Jamal Pasha that everyone had been deported, regardless of their condition, even the elderly, critically ill, the pregnant woman, and the widows, as well as families whose sons were serving in the military. Those deported had not been supplied any form of transportation. They had been forced to walk for days, carrying all of their belongings and on, their, on their backs, forcing some to leave their small children and babies along the way. They were also not supplied with any provisions and were not even permitted to fetch water from nearby neighborhoods. He added that the deportees had been subject to indecent, insulting, and harsh treatment at the hands of gendarmery soldiers and officers on duty. <coughs> Informed of the situation by Saha Khabayan, and to appease the Turkey's German ally, which had again expressed its disapproval of the treatment of Armenians, three days later, Jamal apparently gave a German information officer in Damascus, a transcript in French, it was a circle of series of comments regarding the Armenians to be published in the other provinces. It said, his, it said that his previous orders demanded that Armenians deported to different regions not to be treated badly, had been violated, and the officers and officials who had accompanied the Armenian convoys had treated them harshly and insultingly. Some families had been deported separately from their heads, spouses and children. Some women had been forced to sell their children as they lost the strength to carry them. And all such ill treatment should come to an end. This was a matter that cast a shadow on the empire's national honor and tainted the ideal of Ottomanism in the eyes of Jamal. Consequently, he, it announced that those who had engaged in such ill and oppressive treatment of Armenians were to be swiftly placed under investigation, and these officers who were damaging the honor of the Ottoman state were, were to be tried for treason in court martial. It required the authorities in Aleppo province to send orders to all provinces that deported Armenians were to be provided with the vehicles necessary to accommodate their move, and all their needs along the way were to be met by gendarmeries and other stuff. Meanwhile, Jamal ordered the execution of six, six Sarkasians upon learning of their involvement in an attack on a convoy of deported Armenians. He had already announced on June 19, those army commanders and governors who bore responsibility for the Sarkasians' attack would be tried in court. He would give orders that Armenians were not to be left out without bread, shelter, and burials. And recognizing the desire of large Armenian families to live together, 
He decreed that 10 people were to be placed in one home and ill were to be left alone until they regained their health. In his telegram to Jamal, dated August 5, 1915, the Catholicos, perhaps for the first time, openly narrated the oppression inflicted upon the deported Armenians. He noted that the man in the Erbakir, Diklanagat, and its surroundings had been indiscriminately massacred with no exception. Boys and girls from 5 to 10, as well as many of the widow and single women who had been sent to Aleppo, had been raped in their zone and Rasul Ain before being sold as slaves. He drew attention to the fact that girls, women, and children who had been abandoned in the sun around Arapkana and Rasul Ain situation were inter intentionally detained despite repeated appeals for their transfer to Aleppo and the attacks against them had carried on. Families that were sent from Aintab in two caravans had been blockaded by the gendarmeries and Muslim residents of the area with their belongings and possessions looted and the group suffering deaths and injuries. In his reply, a telegram after three days, Jamal Pasha, who was now in Aleppo, noted that Armenian resistance in Fundajak meant that deportation could not be delayed, explaining that orders had been given once again to all sides to ensure that Armenian families were protected from all forms of misery. However, there is no sign that such orders, if they in fact existed, were ever obeyed. A laxity that is hardly compatible with Jamal's reputation as a disciplinary. The deportation was continuing at full speed with the Armenians subject to this forced migra uh, migration, suffering all sorts of attacks in the re new regions when they arrived. Kirkor Bovaryan, who was deported from Aintab in the middle of August 1915, was someone who, in addition to Catholic Saha, penned interesting notes regarding Jamal Pasha in his own diary he kept through the deportation. Bovaria notes a request addressed to Jamal on April 19, 1916 by a group of Armenian women located in Salamia district of the Hama, which was part of Aleppo province. In this request, they asked that the conditions to which they were being subject to be improved, even if only by a little, and for their survival needs to be met, and for the safety of the spouses and children of the men who were being held for military service. Jamal Pasha would look favorably upon this request. He expedi expedited distribution of sus sustenance and from 26 April until no uh, September 1st, suspended the detention of Armenian men born between 1894 and 1897. In his diary, Kirkor Bavarian also noted that Salamia, where he himself was deported, the situation of the Armenians was better than that those of Armenians exiled to the Azor region, attributing the difference to Jemal's efforts. Elsewhere, he noted that he and his fellow exiles in Hama were grateful to Jamal Pasha for their relatively fortunate situation. Grateful to Jamal Pasha was called from Kirkor Bavarian's diary. These are not my sentences. Others rescued by Jamal Pasha included Melkon Kalemkerian and his family, who resided in Ainta. In his memoir, Melkon Kalemkerian's son, Avedis, notes that it was Jamal who played an important role in his family's being placed in Damascus instead of being exiled to Derzor. When Jamal Pasha was served as governor of Adana, he had been presented with a samovar handcrafted by the coppersmith Melkon. The Pasha became enamored by the craftsmanship he preserved in this item. Upon hearing that Jamal would be visiting Aleppo, Melkon wrote him a letter and visited Jamal at the Baron Hotel, which belonged to the Muslimian brothers. He requested that he and his family not to be sent to the des desert, along with peasants and Bedouin families, and they instead be sent to an area where he could continue to work at his craft. Afterwards, Jamal Pasha would order his aide to prepare a document for Melkon and his family that would allow them to be placed in Damascus. Another interesting incident involved Melkon's son, Avedis Kalemkeri. Avedis, who was a member of the Social Democratic Yunchakian Party, was being sought by the Unionists. The Unionists, who found out he was in Damascus, began to pursue him, eventually catching him and throwing him in jail. <coughs> Afterwards, when Avedis was brought before Jamal, he was immediately released. Jamal understood that the defendant was Melkon's son, and so ordered that he, he be sent. In the end, 
Avedis would end up employed as a head workman in a construction factory established by Jamal Pasha in Damascus in December 1917, with the help of a certification provided by, Je provided by Jamal himself. Hram Sulahyan, born in 1871, is another Armenian who survived the genocide due to the intervention of Jamal Pasha, according to his own memoir. Sulahyan, who was exiled to Damascus along with other members of his family in October 1915, was arrested and then sent back to Aintab in March 1916. After spending four months in a jail, he returned to his family in Damascus. He was arrested yet again and this time transferred to Aleppo. Then he was sentenced to capital punishment by a military court on charges of having participated in so-called revolutionary and nationalist activities. His death penalty was committed, however, upon the intervention of Jamal, and he was later released on his orders. Yet another Armenian whose life was rescued by Jamal was Dikran Sebu Chakmakcian of Ainza. Chakmakcian, who was among the leading photographers and artists of the city, was exiled to Damascus and then to Beirut during the deportation. He drew the portraits of the serving governor and the district governors of both cities, bestowing on Jamal Pasha a portrait of himself as well. Jamal took him under his wing in the administration of his colleagues, genocidal policy have indirectly contributed to the survival even more. Saving the lives of some fortunate Armenians does not exempt Jamal from the label perpetrator, because he was fully committed to the disappearance of Armenians from Turkish soil. In fact, he was distinguished from Talat Enver, Hasin, Cevdet, Abdulkadir, and others not in his goals but in his more confident, more pragmatic, and more realistic choice of means. Talat's practices appear to have been deliberately cruel, aimed at the de death of deportees. Jemal's less violent practice was, one could argue, more realistic, because it will not have robbed the new Turkey of so much labor power, which Asia Minor had always needed, but especially after almost continuous warfare since 1911, nor of so much human capital skills, know-how, and the contacts. Jamal's post-Armenian Turkey would have been more prosperous and more competitive internationally. The only downside for a perpetrator, for a genocide perpetrator like Jamal, was that the empire would become Armenian, more Armenian. More slowly, as the next generation of Islamist, Islamist children gradually replaced their parents, but the Turkish economy would not have been thrown into such chaos and valuable resources would have been conserved. As mentioned above, Jamal Pasha had a simulationist approach towards the elimination of Armenians from Anatolia. That meant Turkification through the conversion of Armenians to Islam. According to his own memoirs and the recollections of Halide Edip, motivation behind his persistent policy in the conversion of Armenian widows the elderly as well as orphaned girls and boys was, in fact, to save the lives of Armenians. Another source for this interpretation of Jamal's action is Bishop Kut, who was present at a private meeting he had with Saha Kavayan's A. The Catholicos, who was sent to Jerusalem from Aleppo on Jamal's orders, would file a written complaint to Pasha, in which he stated that Armenians deported to the towns and villages of Syria and Jordan were being forced to become Muslim and that this was taking place at the hands of a special delegation deployed from Istanbul, which included a conversion unit. Saha Havayan noted that bishops and priests were similarly being forced into Islam, and those who objected were being tortured and killed. Furthermore, the Catholicos said, neither the justice nor the minister of interior officials nor Jamal Pasha himself were keeping their promise of helping the Armenians who had been deported. Jamal, in response, asked the Catholicos to send his most trusted representative to Damascus immediately. Saha Kavayan sent Bishop Kut. When Kut came to face to face with Jamal, who had reacted quite angrily to the letter he received, he heard the following gripping words from Jamal. Quote, I see this matter of conversion in a very humane fashion. Go and tell the Armenians that, until the end of the war, they are free to live as Muslims, Jews, non-believers, monkeys, or donkeys, or whatever else they should please. Is that clear? Go and tell the Catholicos precisely this." Unquote. It seems certain that Jamal was infuriated at 
what he saw as an Armenian ingratitude for his protection, and so frustrated at these constant complaints and, and requests, he exploded. This is what he told. Although he did not express himself clearly, his first time seems to be congratulate himself for his kindness in allowing Armenians to be converted, which he saw as humane, because the alternative was deportation and probably death. It is also important to note that Talat eventually forbade conversions and mass or individually, recognizing that they were done to secure a way for Armenians to remain in their native land. Then, when Talat did allow Armenians to convert, he stated that even Islamized Armenians were to be deported anyway. It was puzzling that Jemaz list in this quote, although eclectic about the ways Armenians were to free to live, quote unquote, does not include as Christians. It could be claimed that he was simply in such a fury that his omission of Christians was an oversight made in the head of the moment. Or he might also have meant once the war was over, Armenians were free to become Christians again. In either case, it's clear that Jamal himself was in such a ladder that he made no sense. Shortly after this meeting, Jamal would head for Jerusalem and Saha Kabayan would visit him there. During his visit, the Catholics complained that the government was not providing the required aid to Armenians. Only to hear the Pasha, who had recovered his composure, responded in the following fashion. Quote, I am speaking to you not as Commander Jamal Pasha, but more of a friend. If you knew of what has befallen to Armenians outside the regions, I comment, you will feel gratitude towards me for the state of Armenians in Aleppo, Damascus, and Jerusalem, and their surroundings. The time we are in calls for silence. Just pray for the war to the end soon. The sooner the war ends, the better it will be for you." Unquote. In fact, Jamal would have, the con would have the conversion unit of the delegation he brought in from Istanbul on, on hand as part of the special committee to help Armenians that he formed his, on his own initiative in March 1916. The existence of this delegation demonstrates that Jamal had not fought his support for his program within the Ottoman elite and that the long arm of his influence stretched all the way to Istanbul. That the purpose of special committee was the genuine desire to help living Armenians is demonstrated by the complaint of one of its members, Hüseyin Kazım Kadri Bey, a founder of the CUP and its official newspaper Tanin. And this guy was a former Aleppo governor as well. Hüseyin Kazım Kadri had traveled all the way from Istanbul to help bring relief to the Armenians only to eventually resign in protest in May 1916, when he felt that authorities were not sufficiently fulfilling their responsibilities and the committee's work was being obstructed. Was the obstruction by design or simply the inherent inertia of any bureaucracy? We don't know. But the very presence of Istanbul delegation with its conversion unit and its members on the special committee to bring relief to Armenians showcases Jamal's assimilationist policy. In the end, for Jamal, reducing the Armenian population to an ethnic minority that no longer posed a threat was possible once the Armenians abandoned their nationality, which would automatically thin the numbers of those who are identified as Armenians. In order to realize this goal, he aimed his conversion and assimilationist policies, particularly at widows, orphan boys, and the girls under 12. This is Aintra Orphanage, established by Jamal in Beirut in 1916 and governed by Halid Edip. Halid Edip was a Turkish intellectual who was there to teach Turkish, to train Turkish uh, Armenian orphans in this Aintra. And speaking Armenian was banned, and when the kids start speaking Armenian, they were beaten. <coughs> if you read um, Karni Panyan's memoir about Aintra, you will see the same statements. Jamal encouraged the marriage of Armenian widows to Muslims, established orphanages for boys and girls where the speaking of any language other than Turkish was banned, and ordered Turkish families to adopt Armenian orphans, give them Turkish upbringings, and inculcate in them Turkish morals and culture. Throughout these efforts, Jamal Pasha did not see his tendency to blame his friends in Istanbul, wherever practices and decisions detrimental to Armenians were concerned. 
German officials accepted Jamal's criticism of Istanbul and disassociation of himself from, from the brutality at face value. According to German sources, it was evident that he did not approve of the CUP or its local representatives' harsh precautionary measures against Armenians and had even attempted to soften the rigidity of their deportation policies. Colonel Friedrich Freyer Kress von Kranstein, who in 1915 was with the 4th Ottoman Army as Jamal's chief of staff, on coming up a group of deported Armenians at the Toros Mountains on November 29, 1915, noted that, quote, Jamal Pasha had become so distraught by, by what he saw that he was unable to speak for a long period of time. He finally broke his silence with these words. Because they cannot witness with their eyes the incredible disaster and misery it will cause, my friends in Istanbul do not hesitate in taking such measures, unquote. The German consul at Aleppo was more laconic, reporting that there are serious signs that the method of killing the exiles on the march shall also be followed in the district of Marash and Aleppo. Jamal Pasha's orders stand in the way, but the committee, CUP, is working for it. Talat and his supporters within the CUP, unfazed by the deaths of deportees, appear to have been deliberately cruel, and so, so do seem the opposite of Jamal, who hope to limit, as much as possible, the deportees' inevitable suffering. Yet, in principle, Jamal supported the deportations with equal vigor. He stood firmly behind the decision that all of the deportations mandated between the period of February through March 1915 were necessary. Later on, in a coded telegram he sent to Talat Pasha on 24th of July 1915, he would request that necessary steps be taken to deport the Armenians in the district of Aintab and Marash to the townships in Aleppo and Syria. Determining Jamal Pasha's role in the Armenian genocide and his actions as a perpetrator can only be understood if we examine these actions within the scope of genocide literature. In the end, there are methods, moments, situations, and attitudes that define being a perpetrator. The most important charge against Jamal is that he supported a policy that would rid the new Turkey of its Armenian population. The attorney for the defense would say his intent was to transform Ottoman Armenians, not to eliminate them, but turn them into Turks by assimilation, albeit compulsory assimilation. According to the concise definition of Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term genocide, forced assimilation is the destruction of national pattern of the oppressed group and the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. To this end, Jamal, within the scope of his area of responsibility as the 4th Army commander, followed a systematic an intentional assimilation policy in Greater Syria. There, where he was deployed, so far from both Istanbul and the Armenian heartland, it remained conceivable for an Armenian to transform him herself, or even himself, into an ideal Ottoman, that is, one who expressed a Turkish identity, one mark of which was the embrace, least culturally, if not ideologically, of Islam. For this transformation to take place, however, the annihilation of Armenian so-called burden was absolutely necessary for Jamal Pasha. Once that identity disappeared, the Armenian issue would automatically disappear for Jamal, ceasing to be burdened for Turkey and for the former Armenian. Thus, the policies and the methods employed by Jamal did not have an exterminatory character, but that does not absolve them, absolve him from the charge of being genocidal in their own right nor did his assimilation solution to the Armenian problem and his adoption of deportations and other forms of compulsion absolve him of his own share of responsibility for the genocide. On the contrary, they make him an important supporter and implementer of it. Furthermore, it's necessary to recall that there may have been a variety of agendas behind Jamal's initiatives in helping Armenians. One was his desire to create a new political order in Syria and to establish state authority there. That required using a maximum advantage the skills of an Armenian labor force, which the state needed. In assuming key roles in the CUP regime, Jamal chose to adhere the decisions of the central government and the CUP central committee, rather than taking the initiative at times when he might have the ability to influence the Armenian situation for the better or to alter in entirety. He never ever had courage to challenge with the decisions of the central authority. For example, 
Jamal play a key role in concealing the heart-stopping treatment to which the deportees had been subjected by giving orders on September 13, 1915 for the German staff and engineer responsible for the construction of the Baghdad Railway to turn over their photographs along with their negatives of the starving and naked Armenians trudging along the railway line to the Baghdad Railway Military Police Unit within 48 hours. He threatened to try those who defied his command in a military court. Thus, Jamal Pasha contributed to the cover-up in line with the orders of the central government. According to the memoir of an Ottoman Jewish civil officer, Jewish civil officer during the war, Jamal ordered to deport from Damascus anyone who will give shelter to Armenian deportees. Having appreciated the loftiness of his duty, he never acted contrary to his patriotic, nationalist, and imperial overcommitment. So, to conclude, suggesting an explanation for the actions of someone who has actively participated in mass violence should not be e equated with forgiving, legitimizing, or turning a blind eye on actions that constitute a crime. But we have an obligation, in a simple sense, to try to understand how people can turn into killing machines. For the actors who perpetuated these crimes deserve our attention at least as much as the institutional structures within which they operate. Generally speaking, in actions where there is continuous state-sponsored violence, the decision makers are top level, political leaders and high-ranking soldiers such as Jamal Pasha. Such actors are loyal to an ideology and to a perception of the future that legitimizes in their view the violence they consider necessary to realize their vision. The core perpetrators at the top of the CUP hierarchy were distinguished as the ideological elite. They carried responsibility for organizing masculines. Despite its complex and varying content, ideology, ideological loyalty play a vitally important role in binding together the members of this core group. But depending on the individual, other motives from revenge to career, careerism, from the beauty that is obtained by seizing and looting when coincidentally taking part in the massacres, the, to the idea of belonging to a large, important group, may become mixed with the central ideological one. Indeed, any combination of these motivations can affect a person's role as a perpetrator. The Armenian genocide was a man-made act, an act of human responsibility. But how and why do regular human beings, normal human beings, become part of such processes? It's important to avoid the reassuring assumption that such events take place somewhere beyond the real of normal reality. To assume this will be to make these events even more difficult to understand than they seem to be. While it may be comforting to assume that normal people like ourselves and normal societies like our society are incapable of committing genocide. We have found through historical example that ordinary people can and do engage in extraordinary evil. As historians, our responsibility is to attempt to explain the events and the ideas that brought people to such evil and try to understand the periods in which this occurs. It's in this context that Jamal Pasha's actions as a perpetrator of genocide become less incomprehensible. As a 20th century nationalist, Jamal firmly believed that his sacred duty was to rescue Ottoman land from the decades of British encroachment, a cause he felt was worth of any sacrifice, including the risk of filling the water of the canal, Suez, Suez Canal, with the corpses of himself and his friends if he could not be victorious. Immediately after resignation of Khaled Pasha's cabinet, October 8, 1918, Jamal fled with seven other leaders to the CUP to Germany, lived in Munich quite some time, and then went to Switzerland, tried in absentia by a military tribunal in Istanbul on war crimes. He was found guilty in July 1919 and sentenced to death. But he actively supported Kemalist nationalist movement in Anatolia, recognized Mustafa Kemal's leadership in Ankara, and had close contact with him until 1920-22. After the establishment of the Kemalist government, he worked for a liaison officer in negotiations between Ankara and the Russian new communist regime. Early in 1920, he served as a military advisor for the modernization of Afghan army in Central Asia. On 21st of July 1922, in Tbilisi, Georgia, 
where he came to act as a military li liaison, li liaison officer to negotiate over Afghanistan with Soviet Russia, Jamal was killed by Armenian assassins, revenge for his role in the destruction of Armenia. Jamal was a pillar of the CUP and a ruthless assimilationist, who nevertheless refused to any extermination of minorities in, cont in, contra in contrast to some of his more flattered political friends. He acted against Arab nationalists in accordance with an Istanbul central imperial logic and reproached them for refusing the centralist Ottoman rule demanded by Talat Pasha. In fact, in the Arab, Arab historiography, he has been commonly referred as as Safa, the blood spill, and blamed for trying to force fortification on greater Syria and for executing hundreds of suspected supporters <coughs> of Arab nationalists. Unlike his treatment of certain Arab families, he did not use the deportation law of May 1915 in a perverted exterminatory way of Talat against the Armenians. As Hans Lukas Kizer cogently states, Jemal's detailed telegram of Talat on November 3, 1916 is telling proof of his harsh social technologies and imperially biased but not exterminatory attitude. Yet Jemal demanded humane transfers. Humane. And forcibly converted tens of thousands of thus saving their lives. In his letters during the war and in even his memoirs <coughs> written afterward, Jemal is happy to fraternize with Talat, that God bless the country through your services, I kiss your cheeks, in one of his letters to Talat Pasha. At the end of the day, Jamal was not only a genocide enabler, but also a perpetrator, even by the definition of the UN, United Nations Genocide Convention. He did not, however, demonstrate the exterminatory zeal against the Armenians of his brother in arms, Talat. Thank you so much for your patience. Dr. Kurt, I think this was a, a new type of lecture bringing nuance to what is commonly seen as Jamal as sort of one figure, but he's a very complex figure, and also bringing uh, Dr. Kurt's approach to violence and what causes human beings to, to be violent. Uh, I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, we'll recognize you, and then Dr. Kurt will uh, respond to your question. So, are there any questions tonight?